Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to what is the uh, last uh, audit committee of this current uh, council session. Um, it's a lovely morning, so um, I hope we can get through the business. Um, just to say, um, this will be Brian Smale's uh, last ever audit committee with uh, Falkirk Council. And I just want to pay tribute to the excellent work which uh, he has done over the years as the, the, the Chief Finance Officer. Um, always provides us with uh, good, solid financial reasoning and um, has, uh, I think, kept excellent control over the finances over the year. So I'm very grateful to him and I wish him all the best in his retirement and I'm sure the rest of the committee will concur with that. Thanks, Brian. Um, moving now to the uh, agenda, have we any apologies? Uh, yeah, can we remove an apology from uh, Councillor Black? Uh, are there any declarations of interest? No, there have been none. I move to the item three, the minute of the audit committee held on the 10th of January. Uh, has anybody any matters arising from these minutes which they wish to uh, bring up? If not, I'll be happy to approve these as a, a true record. Indeed. We move now to item four, which is the internal audit progress report. And uh, I'll ask uh, missing the officer. And are we? Hi. Fine to see. You. Yeah, Isabel, see you oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask Isabel Wright to, to uh, introduce this report. Thank you, Isabel. Thanks, Karina. Good morning, everyone. The purpose of the report is to provide an update on progress with completing our 21-22 internal audit plan. At paragraph 3.3, .3, you will see that the plan agreed by committee in April of last year comprised a total of 25 reviews to be completed by the team during the year. A summary of progress in each of the areas of work is at Appendix 1. Two reviews have been deferred into next year's audit programme and a further two are yet to be started. Details on the scope of and the findings arising from those reviews finalised since our audit committee in September 21 are at Appendix 2. Paragraphs 3.4 and 3.5 highlight the recent work undertaken by the team and services to ensure that any outstanding recommendations have been actioned where they can be. I'd like to thank all staff involved in doing this work. It's, it's always a push to make sure that everything's covered off. So thank you. A summary of those that remain outstanding are set out at Appendix 4. To finish, I'd ask members to note the recommendations and the conclusions. That is that the team are making good progress with the 21-22 internal audit work and are on track to provide our overall annual assurance opinion uh, late, later on in the year on the Council's arrangements for risk management, governance and control based on the internal, internal audit work that we've undertaken during 21-22. So if you've got any questions, I'll try my best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. And I'll open it up to members for questions. Uh, uh, Councillor Michael John Cecil, thank you. Thank you, um, convener. I've got a couple of questions. Um, the first is in relation to um, the um, business grants. And I, I don't know if it's Isabel or whether it's um, Brian or somebody else will want to take this. 
Obviously, um, that there's been much in the press around the five billion gap in the audit of Scottish government's COVID business grants, um, and I just wondered if there's any potential risks for the council in having to go back and retrospectively um, look at that again um, with regard to the payments that have been made, and, and therefore, um, as we're coming out of COVID, um, whether or not that there's, there's there's something that may um, impact on the council. Um, I'll maybe just get that one first, um, convener, and I'll come back with my other question. Yeah. No, I don't know whether Isabel wants to pick up on that, or would it be Brian, or would it be Kenneth? So the question regarding the the audit of the Scottish Government. Convener, if I if I can make some comments and. Um, Isabel, as author of the report, may want to come in behind, and, and indeed the chief executive um, may wish to comment. I, I, I would, um, having having been uh, or had a, an oversight role um, with these multifarious business grants, which has been a very challenge, challenging but important dimension um, in dealing with um, the pressures of of of, of COVID. I know the team that we've had um, or given responsibility at the sharp end for delivering this, um, Pete Reed in place services and Paul Ferguson in my own service have worked very, very well together and have had very, very robust control processes in place. Um, and I think we've always been able to draw a lot of comfort um, from from that. Um, and should uh, there be a request um, to ripple through, as you, as the, the leader has already said, from the position at the national level, I think we could confidently state that we would be able to provide um, effective assurance as to our patch and what we've what we've done done here so i'll stop with with those observations convener thank you brian does anybody else want to come in on that or are you happy with that assurance uh... i'm happy with that assurance but i think isabel was maybe wanting to come oh, in right. um, in support of that yeah I think uh, when we were working on the grants throughout the pandemic, there was so many different streams of work going on and there were so many different sections involved. We were um, in a position where we could help on th in the internal audit team and the corporate fraud team specifically. So we did a lot of pre-payment checks as well as post-payment checks. There's also one other thing to gain some comfort from is that there's a national group that um, was in place throughout and local authorities were sharing information on potential fraudulent claims or applications. So we were able to work together and, for example, things like certain banks that were coming, so certain sort codes, certain accounts that were coming through, the local authorities were sharing those. So I think that we managed to um, catch a lot of potential fraudulent claims at the time. Uh, the corporate fraud team checks, check bank accounts, uh, the internal audit sample check. Going forward, I think all the different um, applications, grants that were coming through, a lot of lessons were learned in terms of how to split out the roles, what checks to do, when to do the checks, what officers to involve, and just refined it as we went along. Even up until last week, the, there were there was information coming back through the local authority network, which would suggest that again that share of information is still going on, and it was to do with a potential fraud and someone who has been claiming different uh, crisis grants and things like that through through various local authorities, and that has has worked well because. Everyone's aware of it in advance, and so others haven't been caught. 
So I think there's quite a lot of good assurance going on that we can take. And we ourselves were not party to a lot of cases really in the grand scheme of what went out and the numbers. We we didn't have a lot of fraudulent claims really. Kavina, I thank um, officers for that. And I know that we did this at pace and um, I, I, I'd comfort that we were doing it well. Um, but I think just that added um, comfort there that if we are required to provide any further detail, that it's not going to put any, any further um, onerous work on our officers um, at this time when we have to get on with, with business as usual. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to that and um, thankful to, for all the work that you did in putting out the business grants. The other question I had um, is in relation to um, the equalities work. Um, we've got the, the Appendix 4 and um, the, the obviously there's a number of outstanding items and I appreciate that, that that's going to be caught up in the best value report. Um, I'm, I'm just um, a, a bit concerned that the, the, the timescales, I mean we've got everything at red and the timescales are quite behind um, and it's just about having a bit of an explanation about that. Um, so that I've got a bit of comfort that it, it, we're not really, it's not really six months outstanding. Um, you know, August um, 21 um, is, is slightly behind time scale, is not really slightly behind time scale. Um, and I, I wouldn't like to think that pub, the public would maybe look at this and, and not, not get a true reflection of, of the work that's ongoing around um, that equalities and diversity um, that has been raised already. Thanks, so, so uh, just given that it, this ties in with the, the, the BVA action plan, um, yes, Kenneth, I was going to ask if you could uh, come in on that. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, um, thank you, um, Chair. So the um, the audit reports, as I understand it, took place in 2020. And I've said before at this committee that um, uh, we have been a bit behind the curve um, on equalities. And what we did, what was done after the um, publication of this um, report is, I think it was April last year, we had a, a pretty comprehensive report coming forward to the corporate management team, setting out the work that we needed to do in relation to equalities, re-establishing an equalities um, working group in order to take that forward. And I think it is worth saying that there has been significant work done in that in the period since then. So we have um, published our mainstreaming report, which is of course a critical aspect. And um, we have been doing um, self-assessment work. And of course the actions that we identified um, and established within the organization were, are, are now wrapped up in the best value um, action plan. So the best value um, um, audit um, identified uh, the same challenges as we'd identified um, internally. So the actions we had are now caught up in the best value action plan. I've asked Patricia Cassidy to take a lead role in that. And I think she's been very proactive already in terms of bringing people um, together and taking the necessary actions. And that's of course, on the back of the very good work that's been done in the health and social care uh, partnership in relation to equality. So I think that, um, acts as a springboard. So there are outstanding actions. There is work uh, to be done. Um, Brian Perry may want to come in on some of the um, specifics, but the, the reassurance I would give is I think now, later than we would have wished, but now that we are we are on top of this um, work and beginning to make good progress. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kenneth. Cecil, you? I, 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 I would just make a plea for us to for this to be updated and, and for something more comprehensive to come back, um, because I, I don't think we're getting the, we're not being able to demonstrate the work that's been done and, and get the credit for actually taking that on board. Um, if, if someone from outside was looking in on this, they, they might not see the work that's going on. Um, I don't know if Brian's got anything he, he just wants to add. Um, and, and the, the, the actual process of where we are and, and how we can take this forward. 
probably not in the process going forward. I think the chief executive co covered that extremely well. It, everything's wrapped up in the best value actions that council agreed back in, in February, and that there's deadlines attached to each of the actions um, centred around the corporate plan being published around about September. In regard to the actual report, page 22, it, as you said, in two of the two of the actions, it says slightly behind time scale when, when they're beyond time scale. That's probably down to me and what I've filled in on Pintana and probably the updates that are given for each each of the actions could have been maybe more detailed and maybe given um, time scale. So I'll take that on and I can update Pintana so that if this does come back, um, it'll be more detailed and you can see the work that's been done with, with actual time scale set against them. Hopefully that'll help. Okay, thanks, Brian. I think I think that would help. Um, if if it does have to come back, then um, we, we get a, a better reflection of the work that's actually been done. Thank you, Brendina. Right, it's on mute. Thanks, uh, councillors. Uh, no more. You're muted, Alan. First today. <laughs> <laughs> it's just going back to the, the National Fraud Initiative, Nigel, it was mentioned earlier on there. I'm just wondering what the criteria is for referring cases onto the National Fraud uh, setup. Is there a, a cash limit uh, before we would actually send details regarding a case or how do we actually, how do we manage this? Okay, I don't know whether Isabel would uh, come in on that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, we we don't actually send the cases on, if you like, to the National Fraud Initiative. It's actually um, data matching that's undertaken by Audit Scotland on behalf of the Cabinet Office. So they pull our information and then they um, generate the matches, if you like. The, we then get the matches back and investigate those matches to see if there's something untoward or there's a good reason for why that they've pulled information. So it, it, you know, I think the example we've given quite a lot of times for NFI is on council tax, for example. So council tax, if people are receiving the single person discount and we find out through all of these different searches that are going on where information is matched that there is actually another person over 18 living in that household, um, rather, other than the person who's claiming the single person's di discount. So that would be a match, if you like. So we would be investigating that to see, well, why, why is someone else living there that's over 18? And you'll see in, in, in one of the next reports as well, it's mentioned again in terms of the work that we do in relation to that. But that could be something as simple as a single parent whose child has become 18 in the meantime, and they then are being classed as an adult. So it's not that someone has been claiming the discount fraudulently, it's just that there's been a change in their circumstances. Okay, thanks, Isabel. Thank you. Any other members have any questions? No, and if not, then Isabel, just a, a, a few questions from myself, if I may. Um, in terms of the reviews that are still to be uh, undertaken, uh, we've, we've got, I think, is it 12 that have, um, 12 to be completed um, and two that haven't been started. So how confident that you will uh, complete these, and when might we receive the report that the uh, assurance has been given or otherwise? Hi, yeah, the the twelve that are ongoing, um, they are in progress. So the work has started on those, so they will be completed. Some of those are at draft report stage, and we're in dialogue with the management teams to get those finalised. So yeah, those twelve will most definitely be completed, um, and some are closer than others. Obviously, it just depends on timing. Some are draft report stage, and we'll have a final report soon. In terms of the two that haven't been completed, 
again, we, we will be completing that before before any assurances will be given. Our internal audit plan for next year and our annual assurance statement will most likely come to the next audit committee whenever that's programmed in and, and to the new term. Uh, so all of those reports will most definitely be completed by then in order to give the assurances that are required. Okay, thanks, Isabel. And uh, just uh, on page fifteen in Appendix One, you, you refer to other client work and and um, and the, the one of those being the Falkirk Community Trust. I'm just wondering, given that that's now that will be from first April incorporated within Falkirk Council, how is that going to impact on internal audit resources? To be quite honest, it won't really impact on our resources. It just means that we will provide assurance in some other area. So, as you as you know, our work is risk based, and we look to pick reviews um, in conjunction with our senior management teams where there is the highest risk. It may be that looking to um, draft a plan that some of those areas coming over from the trust may may warrant um, a look from an internal audit perspective, but really the it won't impact on resourcing because we will just utilise the resources elsewhere within the Falkirk Council plan. Okay, thank you. And finally, I think from myself, just on page 16, um, in relation to the leader grants, the LARCs, uh, I note that it's an absence of documentation on the LARCs. Um, in respect to Scottish canals, now what what is the risk um, to ourselves of not being able to claim uh, reimbursement from the Scottish government as a result of that, and and what steps are we taking to ensure that that we are able to get reimbursement? Again, there's a bill, I think the B. Hi there. I, I think actually the director of, of play services would be best at, to answer that one. I mean, oh. there's, there has been work done, I know, to take some of the recommendations forward, but I think that um, the director's probably got more information on that that they can give. Okay. I'll ask uh, Malcolm then to come in on that, please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um... Just to update that uh, we had productive conversations with the Scottish Government last week and um, the outstanding issues relating to this are all resolved. So uh, full funding has been drawn down and the, the matter is settled. Okay, and thank you. That's a, that's a positive result. Uh, thank you. Are there any other questions from members in regard to this item? There have been none. We're happy to uh, approve the recommendations then that uh, progress has been made on the internal audit plan and that work, and we note that the uh, work continues with services to ensure its implementation. Okay, moving to the next item, which is the corporate risk management update. And that will be Brian. Yes, convener. Uh, thank you, um, and good morning, and thank you for your kind words at the the front part of the, the meeting. Um, this provides a, an update on the paper last submitted to you in the in the autumn. Um, so it's a a regular update that the committee gets. I think it's worth noting at the outset that the the forthcoming elections and the new council that will flow from that has provided a something of an oppor opportunity uh, to state to take stock of how we're positioned on risk management and indeed on the back of that um, if need be to somewhat reset matters uh, and I think there's probably two two aspects to this one is um, training um, of both members and of course by definition as we know there will be um, new members um, from May um, that's just from 
those members demitting, uh, leaving aside the vagaries of the, the ballot box, of course. Um, so there will be new uh, members and also for officers as, as well. And I think we just maybe need to um, up the ante uh, somewhat and embed a, a more acute understanding of the importance of this management in an organisation as diverse, complex and large as as ours. Um, that's not to criticise what's there. We do a, a sound grounding, but I think we should use that as a platform to move to the next level. And um, a second strand to it is I think um, the actual corporate risk management working group looking as it's already planning to do uh, as it will have a new chair with um, my departure um, just to take stock and um, consider um, whether there are changes that could be made that would make it more effective in delivering its its role. I think jumping then to the, the, the body of the report convener, um, we have at 5-1 a reminder flowing from the policy statement that was agreed back in the autumn uh, of the respective responsibilities between the audit committee and executive. And I'd just rereading what's written there, uh, it has horizon scanning uh, down for the executive. I wouldn't uh, think there's a rigid uh, demarcation issue there, and I would think the audit committee um, of itself can add value in that arena uh, where it sees um, risks emerging on emerging on the horizon. So we, we move to the the core of the report in terms of the several main strands. So the first one picks up on the corporate risk summary, which is detailed at appendix appendix one. Um, and here we're looking to draw out uh, new and emergent um, corporate risks. And you can see in that first section, there's four that have, are set out there, several particularly relating to to schools and children's services. So we've got the first one is contest. And again, you can see the narrative that sits behind it. Air quality in schools, where we know that there are no significant issues uh, identified, but um, uh, an area that we will look to keep our eyes on. Um, school breakfast at the bottom of page 26. And then the fourth one, um, dealing with fleet and tree safety. And maybe just no noting in terms of fleet that um, the issue of um, high claims rate is something that was picked up by uh, the live ZBB, zero based budgeting exercise, and a element of savings is reflected and built into the budget um, flowing from expected improvements and tightening of processes in that area. At 5.3, um, we're picking up on implications flowing from the, the best value review and adjusting on the back of that uh, the assessment. But of course, as has been touched on earlier in the agenda with respect to equalities, the um, risk, um, sorry, the, the BVR action plan, which is very comprehensive um, and specific, will, as those actions are addressed, feed through to uh, recalibration of that assessment. So I think we should view that perhaps as a temporary blip, um, points well made, but they will get addressed. Halfway down page 27, uh, we pick up in the corporate risk uh, dashboards. Um, and again, a recognition of certain areas where um, adjustment has been made on the back of the, the best value review. Um, high risk and limited assurance continues to be uh, applied to equalities, as we've heard earlier. Uh, climate change, which clearly is a, a, a big issue. Um, and I know the new director of place is very proactive in looking to take that agenda forward 
um, health and safety uh, noted there as well. And of course, um, not losing sight, as we don't, of uh, COVID-19 uh, still with us. And perhaps given the um, resurgent rate of um, infection, a salutary reminder of just how much it's still with us. We then turn um, at the bottom of, or towards the bottom of page uh, 27 to various reports, national level reports that um, we look to capture and feed into our assessment of the position. So there are three reports that have been picked up. Um, the first one on climate change from Audit Scotland. And interesting to note as the first sentence in that uh, section does, um, proposals to embed climate change into wider external audit activity. And I think that should come as no surprise uh, given its significance um, across across the spectrum. Um, we do have um, a, what's termed a, a, a deep dive review um, in play, but that will go to uh, the scrutiny committee and the new council. Um, over the page, cyber risks, um, and I think there's a salutary reminder of the impact and significance and inherent risk um, from a very near neighbour of ours in terms of the devastating impact such an attack had on SEPA. Um, there's been a lot of learning taken from that and indeed to illustrate the point, corporate management team uh, recently considered a specific paper on the um, nature of that attack. Uh, and the lessons to be learned. But I think given the situation in Ukraine and Russia, um, there's even more of a, an ease um, around cyber risk that I think we need to be alert to. And then the third strand is uh, relating to uh, poverty. And again, an Audit Scotland report focusing on housing benefits. In terms of the corporate risk improvement plan, the last uh, strand, um, parified nine, we note that there's good progress, some slippage in some areas, but overall good progress. So I think there's a, a positive we can take from, from that. And convener, if I just take the committee back to the recommendations at the, the front end of the report in section two, uh, and as you'll see, um, some of the content here is a standard practice referred on to the executive for its consideration in due course. Um, I'll stop there, convener, and um, along with colleagues at the, the meeting, we'll look to address any questions that could be put. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you, Brian, for that. Do we have any? Questions or comments from members? Cecil, Councillor Michael John, thank you. Thanks, convener, and, and thanks to Brian for that. Um, which demonstrates that the depth and the depth of the work that's, that's going on um, there. Um, what um, I was wondering is um, in relation to. Um, what is going on around cyber crime and um, what in particular um, the, the risks are um, to the, the, the council um, and, and, and it probably covers a number of areas uh, there so I, I appreciate it's probably going to be a kind of um, broad um, <clears throat> answer in, in relation to that uh, because it's something that is, is very real and it's, it's about being ensuring that um, our data is, is safe, but also that the data relating to um, our, our um, customers um, is also safe um, in relation to that. It's maybe worthwhile just noting, convener, that um, in terms of the 
uh, risk plan that was put to the pension committee uh, recently, and there is a SEPA member on the board um, complementing the, the actual pension committee, and there was quite a bit of discussion um, around uh, cyber risk um, there, and uh, you know, I, I, I think the committee and board got comfort in terms of um, the actions that um, were being taken to ensure that we were as um, robustly placed uh, as it's possible to uh, to be. Thank you, Brian. I see Karen with a hand up. Thanks, Karen. Yeah, thank you, convener. So, just to provide the reassurance to committee that our IT colleagues have been keeping um, a close watch on what happened with the SEPA situation. They have um, investigated all of the lessons learned. They've spoken to officers within SEPA as well as the local government digital office about the safeguards that we should be taking as an organisation to protect both our internal and external facing data. So we've put a number of mitigations in place to ensure the council is as well protected as it can be. As Brian mentioned, we had a report to the corporate management team a few weeks ago outlining the steps that have been taken and also setting out some additional tasks that we will do to further protect the council as much as we can. Um, as Brian said, with the, the situation in Ukraine, there are um, increasing threats and a belief of increasing threats there for cyber crime. And we've also been working with the various national bodies that oversee cyber crime on both a Scottish and UK wide basis. And if we get any alerts into anything, we automatically check our systems to ensure that our systems are protected against any of those threats that we are notified of. Um, so to date, it, we have been okay. It's fair to say that in the same way as any other organisation, um, we are as vulnerable as any organisation with good protections in place, um, but we are doing everything we possibly can to mitigate against any risks that are out there. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Are you happy with that response, Cecil? Thank you. I see uh, Councillor Nimmo, Alan, you have your yeah, hand up there. Thanks. Thanks, Nigel. It's going back to page 26 uh, and the issue of the, the terrorism uh, risk assessment side of things. This is going to be a big piece of work, obviously, uh, and there's going to be quite a significant amount of training involved for people involved in this. There could also be a significant financial risk to the Council in respect to this. I'm just wondering if we can get some further information or some clarification as to what the financial risk is likely to be. Thanks, convener. Okay, thanks. I don't know who uh, would come in on that. I don't know whether, given that schools, whether Gary, Green, or, or no, actually Kenneth is uh, going to come in on that. Thanks. Um, just very briefly, I'll perhaps leave um, Brian to. Uh, pick up on the issue of financial risk, but Councillor Nimmo is right to identify the importance of this work. Um, it has been ongoing uh, for some time. Um, as you say, um, Chair Director of Children's Services is our lead on this, but we do actually have a training session for the whole of the management team uh, with uh, the police and other relevant bodies taking place, I think, with this in a fortnight's time first. 1st of April, as I recall, um, and um, so we do take this very um, seriously. We are ensuring that we're um, working with the, um, the new legislation as a reference there to Martin's law as well, which is the uh, legislation um, to improve the safety and security of public venues and spaces. And the implications of that is something which we'll clearly be working through at this um, event we have scheduled for the next couple of weeks, but that is a potentially significant issue for the council and indeed for other um, bodies who have responsibility for um, uh, public spaces. So thank you. And I'll, I'll, as I say, I'll see, I don't know if Brian wants to talk about the financial um, aspect of the risk. Thank you, Kenan. Well, whether Brian's still with us, he's. Uh... 
but see his, his pictures disappear so whether he's got a problem line and Gary have you any comment to make on that at all no he's disappeared as well no thank, thank you Mina. just to say that in the police got on to discuss the ongoing risk the current risk assessment is I'm sorry, convener, but Gary keeps he's breaking up. It's really difficult to hear him. Yeah. Sorry, Gary, we're not able to hear you anymore. Okay, sorry, convener, that we're having some technical problems with our Wi-Fi in the offices this morning, unfortunately. Got you now, yeah. Oh, okay. So, sorry, Kevin, just to say that the, the Chief Exec was correct. The 1st of April is the meeting where we'll, we'll consider with Police Scotland and we'll review the current risk assessment that's been made and that's reflected in the, the report before audit today. The, the, there's further details that will be contained in several uh, services on risk assurance statements that we prepare on an ongoing basis uh, in liaison with our own corporate, uh, corporate teams. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Okay. Are there any other questions from members? I just was seeking clarification, uh, if I may, on a page 28, paragraph 510. Just, can you just clarify what the slippage is? And, um, we ha I think we have a time scale for September 22 for the completion of this, but uh, can, as I say, just a clarification on the slippage. Well, Brian's able to answer that. Sorry, convener, I, I didn't catch the reference at the very front end of your comment in terms of the, the, the paragraph you were referring to. Yeah, it's uh, page 28, paragraph 510. 28, 5. Um, it's in relation to the yeah yeah I, I, the improvement the, the plan. Difficulty, sorry yeah convener. The, the 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 issue there is the linkage and interface with um a broader piece of work that's um being progressed under performance and it's just to make sure that uh there's an alignment and um consistency so that i think is well um, in hand so once once that that stage is completed uh, there's no reason or no excuse that the risk uh, elements can't be progressed um, apace and Thank I think you, you'll, in the next the next report back to you I think you'll 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 have hard evidence of that being demonstrated Thank you. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions on this? Are we happy then to agree the recommendations and that we refer the report to the executive? Agreed. Thank you. Moving on. The next item is the uh, fraud risk assurance statement. That's agenda item number six. And I is that coming from visible again? Yep. Thank you. Thanks, convener. So the purpose of this report is to provide an update to some work promised at a previous audit committee last year, which related to a fraud and irregularity report published by Audit Scotland in July 21. Section 3 provides a background for this, highlighting what Falkirk Council's internal audit, risk and corporate fraud teams have done and continue to do to provide assurance in the areas mentioned. At section four, you'll see that services were asked to review their governance arrangements for the prevention and detection of fraud, noting Audit Scotland's seven recommendations in seven key risk categories that they identified public bodies should have in place to ensure good governance and counter fraud arrangements. 
The appendices make clear the recent and ongoing action undertaken, as well as highlighting those areas where further action will be taken over the course of the next few months. You will also know at paragraph 4.6 that risk assessments are an ongoing process and that services need to continuously review their fraud risks, their lessons learned, etc. It's therefore recognised that further work is needed to develop, to develop this new framework, capturing fraud risks and controls across council areas. Paragraph 4.8 states that these statements will be monitored as part of the quarterly service assumed statements process. To finish, I draw your attention to the recommendations at paragraph 2.1. And thank you. I'll take any questions. Hopefully. Thank you, Isabel. I'll open it up to members for questions. It's, uh, I see no hand. So, um, just in terms of uh, the uh, financial control environment, given that we are the, like the council's currently undergoing a significant change in uh, senior roles across the uh, organisation, and how, what sort of what influence is, is this going to have on uh, the financial control environment? Yeah, I think that the because it's a continuous assessment we will be providing information on on, on the quarterly basis. It is going to be that there's always going to be a look. Yes, there could be um, some changes coming up that could impact on that, but I think that keeps the focus on these areas and making sure that we're continuously assessing what's, what's going into the statement. So that should help. That should help negate any issues there and reduce that risk. Thank you, Isabel. As you say, it's the, the, the risk assurance statement, uh, the quarterly statement is, is very welcome. And, and uh, as you say, it's it's a continuous process and uh, a continuous update or a regular update on, on progress on that. It's very welcome. And I know that report's going to come uh, to the audit committee in addition to uh, other venues. Are we happy? I take it. I see no other hands up. So, I take it the committee are happy to agree the recommendations as set out in Para two point one. See some nods. We are agreed. Okay. Um, turning now to item uh, seven, which is the corporate fraud update report. Again, is that from Isabel? No, it's from myself, convener. I beg okay. okay, your pardon, Karen. Right. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Convener, this report provides committee with with what is now becoming a regular update on some of the work that we are doing to minimise corporate fraud. At paragraph five point three of the report, you'll see the range of documents that um, we previously reported to committee, and we agreed that we would review to safeguard against fraud as far as possible. A number of officers have now been involved in the review of these documents, and I'm pleased to report that the whistleblowing policy, the anti-fraud and corruption strategy, and the associated investigation procedures for that document, as well as the financial regulations and the contract standing orders have all been updated and now agreed. These documents are now also getting added to our, our website for others to view them as well. Of the documents that we've still to review, we've got the Code of Conduct for Officers and Members, as well as, as well as the Register of Interests and Gifts. These are being worked on and they will be finalised as soon as possible and submitted both to the Corporate Partnership Forum, given that they have employee implications, and then on to members thereafter. Um, and that will probably be post the election, just given the time scale. It will be post the election, given the time scales now. A summary of the work undertaken by the corporate fraud team has, is also provided at Appendix 1 of the report. And the committee needs to see this to ensure that you've got appropriate oversight of the work being done to tackle fraud. So 
So the document covers the period April 21 through to February 22. And you'll see that um, there's a lot of work getting done to raise awareness of fraud activities through both the um, induction programme as well as the pre-retirement courses that we run and other engagement sessions are also planned by the team as we go forward. We've talked earlier this morning about the National Fraud Initiative, which the team are actively working on. You'll know that that was paused due to fraud, but it's now well underway in terms of the work of the team. And you'll also see that the team have been doing the work, as again we've talked about earlier this morning, to minimise fraud-related activities in relation to grants and support that was issued due to COVID as we covered earlier this morning. We also have the work in there that the team undertake to investigate any whistleblowing allegations or other allegations that are referred to them. Committee will recall um, a previous discussion on the importance of also having performance indicators for the corporate fraud team and work was done to develop three indicators, indicators which are presented for committee's consideration at paragraph 5.1 of the report. These are similar to the ones that we use for the audit team, so it seems appropriate that they would be applied to the corporate fraud team. Um, the implications convener are set out at section 7 with the recommendations at section 2, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, and uh, we welcome the, the prospect of in, increased reporting and the fact that we're now benchmarking uh, what we're doing is a significant uh, step uh, forward, I would say. Um, any members, uh, any member have any comments or questions regarding this report? Yeah, Cecil, Councillor Michael John. Yeah. Thanks, um, convener. Um, it, it's probably more a comment um, and, and, and just a, a, a caution that. Um, as a result of doing all of this work, I fully anticipate we will see um, the request for, for more investigations to come through in relation to potential fraud. Doesn't mean necessarily that there are or there is any more fraud or any fraud actually has gone on. Um, and I think we just need to be um, keep that into uh, kind of context. Um, what it will do, and uh, hopefully, is, is identify any um, improvements that are needed in processes and procedures going forward. But um, I just think if we just need to keep an eye on what we see coming through in these reports um, and that any increase in numbers isn't necessarily related to the fact that there's any fraud actually um, being carried out. Um, can be uh, just be, be mindful of, of the, 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 the unintended consequences of improvements um, aren't necessarily always um, clear. Yes, you can take your point uh, there, uh, Kenneth. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, um, Chair. Just, just very briefly, um, I mean, I don't disagree at all with the leader's comments. I suppose both this report and the previous one um, underline the very considerable importance of keeping on top of this. There were concerns. Um, previously raised, um, and we just need to ensure that we have uh, the resources in place that we're responding you know, energetically and comprehensively to issues um, that might be raised. I think that the, um, the audit team and the fraud team are uh, doing a very good job in that regard, and they absolutely need the support um, of the, the, the organization, both senior managers across the organization and uh, this committee as well. So um, I, I just I didn't want these reports to um, pass without um, really me emphasizing my view as chief executive that we've got really important work uh, to do here. And as the, as the leader says, we absolutely need to keep on top of it. Thank you, Kenneth. And I agree, it is an area we need to keep on top of all the time. And any other questions or comments on this? If not, are we happy to agree the uh, recommendations as set out in Para 2.1, including the introduction of the recommended performance indicators? We're happy to approve that. Thank you.
Moving to the last item on the agenda, and I apologise to uh, Stephen for not um, welcoming him at the, at the top end of the meeting, but uh, Stephen uh, from uh, from uh, Ernst & Young is here with us to re uh, present the final um, item uh, on the, our agenda. So, Stephen, thank you. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning, everyone. So, convener, this uh, annual audit plan uh, comes to the committee in uh, draft at this stage, uh, and uh, like all years, we'll continue to update the plan as we move through the audit, reporting any significant variations to the plan, and we'll report the results of the audit. Uh, convener, I'm sorry, but it's really difficult to hear, Stephen. Are you able to get closer to your mic, Stephen? It just it is a bit, it's a bit faint at this end, I have to say. No, you're muted. Is that any better? A wee bit, yeah. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, convener. So, this plan summarises uh, the intended approach to the external audit for 21-22. Uh, which members will know is the final year of our appointment as the Council's external auditor, having been uh, the appointment having been extended uh, by uh, one year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Convener, the plan is presented uh, in draft at this stage and will be uh, updated through the course of the uh, audit, as is normally the case. If there's any material changes to the plan, I will, of course, uh, provide an update to the committee uh, through the year but especially uh, when the results of the audit are reported uh, later in the year. My responsibilities as the external auditor remain unchanged from the prior years and fall into two distinct areas. Firstly, to provide an opinion on the Council's financial statements and then to consider uh, the uh, wider scope uh, aspects of public audit. Coming firstly then to the uh, true and fair opinion on the financial statements. Uh, the materiality level uh, has been set out at page 63 of the pack or page 4 of my report and the approach to the materiality and the calculation of that again remains unchanged. Importantly for the committee, we will report uh, all differences either adjusted or unadjusted uh, of 250,000 uh, or uh, more. In terms of the key areas of focus when undertaking the audit of the financial statements, uh, those largely remain unchanged from the prior year and uh, focus on the uh, recognition of revenue and expenditure, management override, the valuation of property plant and equipment and the valuation of the uh, net pension uh, liability. Uh, members may be aware that there are some consultations ongoing at the current time by SIPFA uh, into the content of the code and the basis on which the Council prepares its financial statements, which would affect all local government bodies across the UK. Uh, those areas of consultation uh, relate to uh, uh, the uh, IFRS 16, so the adoption of leases, the valuation of PP and E, and I'm also aware that there's some ongoing discussion around accounting for infrastructure assets. Once those issues have been determined, I will uh, report back uh, to committee and liaise with management uh, where they have a material impact or change in scope of the external audit. Uh, at the current time, uh, it's too early to say until SIPFA has concluded their considerations. In relation to the uh, wider scope uh, dimensions, uh, I've set out there in relation to the four areas within the, the draft audit plan uh, the specific areas of uh, focus. Clearly, in terms of financial sustainability, uh, building on uh, our conclusions, my conclusions in last year's annual audit report, uh, I continue to express significant concerns about the financial sustainability of the Council and the level of work that needs to be undertaken in short order. Uh, and there will be a specific focus again on this area as part of the audit activity. Uh, in the year, and I set out the context of that uh, within the report. In relation to uh, the other areas, uh, we I've set out the detail in the plan, 
clearly a key element of the work around uh, all of the areas of the wider scope dimensions will to be under will be to undertake uh, some follow up activity on the BV uh, action plan that was considered by council earlier in the year. And I'll also report progress, our, our view of progress on that as part of the uh, annual audit report uh, in uh, due course. Together with progress on the other recommendations which we've made in the previous annual audit report uh, and observations, including around uh, capacity, uh, significant changes uh, and other uh, key matters uh, currently being considered by the Council. I've set out within an appendix, as this is the final year, also our uh, focus uh, uh, over the different years of the audit around wider scope dimensions, and particularly draw your attention to the fact that in this, their final year, the final area that needs to be uh, and will be considered uh, as set out in Appendix C for the best value coverage is in relation to sustainability. Uh, so clearly uh, aligns very closely with some of the work that the Council is doing. Chair, I'm very happy to take any observations, uh, comments or questions on the plan, but just before I, I pass back to you, I do just also want to pay my respects uh, and best wishes to Brian. Uh, Brian and I have now worked together five and something years uh, as the external auditor, and you'll be pleased to hear, uh, convener, uh, that we haven't always agreed on matters, which is entirely appropriate as the external auditor and the, the, the Section 95 officer ought not to. Uh, but uh, I have greatly valued uh, Brian's approach to the external audit, uh, and it's been uh, a privilege to have worked with him uh, over the years as the external auditor. So now very happy to pass back to you. Thank you, Stephen. I'll open it up to members for questions or comments on okay right oh, right councillor michael john cecil cecil thank you yeah, um thank you um i think um steve has probably kind of answered the, the question i was going to ask um but just being mindful that public purse is very very tight and it's about being able to firm up on the the auditor's fees uh, for the years um and um and I, I, I fully anticipate brian will have made assumptions for, for for that within um but it's just being able to, to to do that um and actually um firm up on the additional um works that are required but i think you, you kind of highlighted um that that within um you, what you said stephen um but there are other aspects um that um you know, as a council, we, we are looking at, and it's a, particularly around the divestment of fossil fuels and um, the, the work that's ongoing, because we're, we're not the only local authority looking at that. And I just wondered um, if that had been factored into any of, of the, the discussions you'd had um, already. Through you, convener. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, councillor. Uh, the uh, matter in relation to the fees absolutely very much focused on that, and there are other moving parts that we uh, need to see firmed up before I can conclude on that. Uh, but absolutely, it's front of mind, and I'll continue to liaise uh, with uh, uh, the, the new uh, CFO in, uh, through the course of the audit to do that. In relation to uh, the investment strategy, uh, of the uh, council, clearly we have a responsibility through the wider scope dimensions and particularly around uh, both financial management and governance and transparency to consider the council's uh, review and timely consideration of its investment strategy and the monitoring that has that takes place uh, during the year. So our focus councillor is on the governance process around that rather than per se the specific investment and policy decisions which councillors uh, may make uh, to inform uh, the, the policy. Okay, th thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Karina. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody, any other member, any question? Uh, can I just ask uh, Stephen, uh, uh, the Scottish Government uh, deadline for uh, reporting on uh, the uh, audit for the year ended uh, 2022 is the 31st of October. Where are we in respect of that time scale or what do you anticipate uh, 
where do you anticipate being in respect of that that time scale? Um, thank you, convener. So we've had some uh, uh, early engagement and discussions uh, with. Uh, Brian's team in relation to agreeing a jointly uh, uh, agreeing a joint timetable for the audit. Uh, we are working uh, to completion by that deadline at this point in time, and we're also very mindful uh, that we do need to transition to new appointed auditors in due course. Uh, so the timely conclusion of the 21-22 audit is in everyone's interests uh, to allow uh, us to exit and uh, the new auditors uh, to begin uh, their uh, engagement with officers and planning early planning uh, considerations. But I will keep committee updated, as will officers, I'm sure, uh, if there needs to be any change uh, to that plan timetable at this point in time. Thanks, Stephen. Just as a kind of uh, uh, follow on from that, in terms of actually conducting the audit, I mean, obviously, the last couple of years, it's been done remotely. Um, which has presented its its own difficulties. Um, are we going to see uh, you physically uh, in the office um, during the course of this audit, do you think? Or is it all going to be staying on Teams and whatever else? Um, very good question, uh, convener. And in fact, one of the discussions that we have been having with officers the intention this year is uh, subject to the trajectory of uh, COVID and the respective policies and risk assessment is to uh, take a hybrid approach to the audit. Uh, so there will be some time uh, undertaking the audit on site, but also uh, undertaking the audit virtually as we have done for the past few years. And we'll work through and we're working through the practicalities of that to ensure that we uh, are all able to be on site at the time that works with officers to maximise the efficiency and the effectiveness of the process, recognising, of course, that being on site five days a week uh, is not the right answer. Uh, and in fact, the last few years has, has proven that, uh, that we've been much more uh, innovative collectively in how we undertake an external audit. Thank you, Stephen. Are there any further questions or comments? Can I just say thank you to Stephen and, and Grace, who's not here, Grace Hanlon, who's not here today, um, for the diligence that you've shown us, the auditors, uh, over the last, uh, well, coming up for five years now. And uh, thank you. Sometimes you've not told us what we want to hear, but um, the idea of audit is keeping us on the right track and making sure that uh, assurance has been given that we are uh, doing the right thing. And I think you've kept us there along in conjunction, of course, with, with Brian and his finance department uh, and others within the council. So uh, thank you for that. But um, if there's no other um, business, that takes us to the end of, um, as I say, the final audit committee for this uh, for this council session, this five years have gone very quickly, I have to say. And I thank you all for your contribution. And uh, I think we can hopefully now go out and enjoy some sunshine. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you, you Nigel, for taking on the role um, of convener. I know it's it's been a bit of a challenge over the last five years, but um, and it's been a short time for you, but you've done well, well, and we appreciate your your governance in doing that. I, I thank you. I saw Brian just. Uh, were you were you waving cheerio, Brian? <laughs> I saw a hand up. I was just waving cheerio, convener. <laughs> a very a very vigorous wave it was too. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> with a smile on your face. Bye all. Thank you very much.